Yorana. Taiti. When you sit down for dinner, what you see before you is a plate of food. I'm going to talk about a much bigger way of looking at that plate of food, a way that goes beyond the plate, beyond the recipe. And it's, a, it's a, an approach to food who's designed to empower chefs, to stimulate national economy, to reclaim tradition and health. I call it the power of cuisine. Um, I was born in New Zealand, but had the very good luck to grow up in the Pacific Islands. If you can imagine coming from the dreary, sanitized supermarkets of New Zealand to be thrown into the marketplace in Suva Fiji, it was, it was like the lights coming on for the first time. What, something else that happened when I arrived there, well, you've got a great market here, so you know how that looks. When I arrived in Fiji, there was a dock strike. So there were none of the palangi ingredients available. There was no potatoes, there was no flour, there was no sugar. So my mother, had to, she was thrown into the market to cook the family meals, a meal along with her. We here had to cook taro and cassava instead of potatoes. Most of the time we had itchy throat from very badly cooked fafa leaves. I think you know what I mean by that. But in this, my destiny as a chef was mapped out for me. I ended up living in New York, and I was putting restaurants together for a very large, uh, well-known US restaurant group in New York, Las Vegas, and Miami. I did this for many years. At the same time, I worked creating community food programs, including one that I created with a group of friends, feeding, feeding homeless people in New York City subway systems. We'd feed up to 2,000 people a day. I love this work. Uh, the restaurant work, I would say, fed my creativity, but the food programs fed my heart. I was offered a consultancy in the Caribbean, putting 21 restaurants into three resorts. What I found really amazed me. Almost all the food was being imported, but I'd, Pacific people go to the market right away when they arrive somewhere. So I'd been to the market, I'd seen the food, I knew there were farmers. So I set about making growing contracts with the farmers to supply the hotels. I had control of the menus, you see, and this was the creative glue that joined tourism to agriculture. I really, I really realized the power of being a chef because through my menus, I could leave literally millions of dollars in the island economy. The menus were the business plan of the nation and small island tourism economies. One thing kept coming up, though. The local chefs did not think their own indigenous cuisine was good enough for the restaurants good enough for home, but they didn't want to put it on the restaurant menu. I completely disagreed, but I knew that to get a wholesale swing into local supply in the hotels, I had to encourage the development of local cuisine. Local cuisine requires local agriculture. You see, when food is in tourism, it becomes tourism for everybody, from the farmers to the breadfruit farmer to the fishermen to the vanilla growers, everybody. I often think of Thailand, and here I see a very successful cuisine. All of the street vendors, which they're all micro-economies, often family-based, they all have Thai cuisine, their indigenous cuisine, as their offering. So it reaches into the, into the fishing communities, into the farming communities, and it creates a whole dynamic of prosperity. But there's more than that. When you buy something from a street vendor in Thailand, something magical happens. It's like the sharing of your heart, the sharing of yourself, that moment when the vendor looks at you to see if you enjoy their dish. Food creates a culture of kindness. I knew the same was true in the Pacific as it was in the Caribbean. We didn't put much of our Polynesian and Melanesian food on the menus. Part of it was our fault. I was raised in Fiji and Samoa, and I, I know that we just naturally seem to think that anything, anything from overseas is better. So I guess we didn't value the, the, the indigenous Pacific cuisine as much as, say, French, or Thai, or Italian cuisine. Colonialism also had come on right after, uh, tourism, sorry, had come in right after colonialism. And I, th I think that some of that psychology had stayed on. There was a, an Oxford study that um, talked about how the settlers, when they came to the Pacific, they taught the Pacific Islanders, they civilized the Pacific Islanders by changing their diets, including not eating local food. The Central Pacific also, especially Fiji, Samoa, and Tonga, had become the dumping grounds for low-quality meats. And these had had a shocking effect on, on domestic health, as well as somehow coming to define Pacific food to the outside world. But this was not Pacific food. Pacific food, the original Pacific diet, was based on coconuts, seaweeds, tropical fruits, all the greens, all the com complex carbohydrates, really a superfood diet. 
Still, when tourists came in, they tended to ask for more of what they had at home. So maybe for them, Pacific cuisine wasn't good enough. I just want you to think about if a, if, if a whole region is told by like a lot of incoming tourists, for example, if the message is that their food isn't good enough. Food is core to who we are. It's what our mothers make us. It's our cultural sense of self. It is us. So to be told, or the message being given, that your food is not good enough for, for us, I think that really hurts. I think it's cultural pain. Around this time, I met a fantastic tourism academic at the Univers University of the South Pacific called Dr. Tracy Berno and an awesome Fijian photographer called Shiri Ram. And we sat down and we thought, let's make a regional Pacific cookbook to give something to the chefs to work off, to um, just create excitement around the cuisine and also build an awareness of the cuisine in the markets that we would launch the book. So I came back to the South Pacific. What we found was amazing. There was an organic revolution running through the Pacific. Now, organics in cuisine is a luxury brand. It's a health brand, but it's a top end of value in terms of food. Organics in the Pacific is a replication and a validation of the original Polynesian and Melanesian farming methods. So it's a natural fit. It's our natural asset. I also love the way the Pacific people came together over food. I'd always loved this, and this is something I missed when I left the region. In the, in the Pacific, food strengthens and creates communities. The story of the food is the story of the people. I found incredible leadership. In Samoa, for example, there's an NGO called Women in Business Development, and they've steered that nation's organic revolution so that there are now close to 1,000 organic family farms in Little Samoa. By the way, they supply the, hotel, the Samoa's tourism industry and they export their coconut oil to the body shop. This is an amazing organization. A friend of mine in New York, who's a very prominent GMO activist, said to me that apparently a, gr a group of determined ladies from Samoa are managing to do something that world governments cannot do. There's also Sashi Karan, a friend of Fiji. She's formed a, a network of micro-business based on the Indo-Fijian recipes of jam, chutley, and jelly making. And this provides great income for, for local families, often hit hard by the failure of the sugarcane industry in Fiji. And then there's my, my mentor and my dear friend, Suliana Siwatimba in Fiji. Suliana is saving Pacific heritage crops. She's also an expert in Pacific traditional healing through food. So she understands that when you lose a crop, you don't just lose the food, you lose knowledge, you lose wisdom, you lose culture. There were, there were many more, by the way. Um, there was Papilo Foliaki in Tonga, there was Vatasi Mackenzie in Vanuatu, and many, many more. And I realized that these women were not just creating smart food systems, they were creating a whole way to live. So this is the vision that began to emerge for me, and this is an example of Samoa, the power of cuisine, a vision for Samoa. If you drop authentic Samoan cuisine based on local organics into the tourism industry, you create, it's good for the environment because organic farming takes care of the environment. It's great for the visitors because they get to engage with the real Samoan, real Samoan food, with all the kindness and hospitality that comes with that food. The chefs, they get to cook their own food, finally, their soul food. This is what they're really good at. So it leverages their natural capacity. Um, National economy, less, food is, less money is sent offshore, and more stays in the hands of small-scale farmers. And there was more and more and more. I just started to see this whole arc of development, and I began to view cuisine as a development tool as I went. I wrote all this thinking into this book as I went. So six countries, um, two years, about 43,000 coconuts later, I was done. In the process, the, rece the recession had hammered the US. So while I was on the road, I lost my home, I lost my business, I actually went completely broke. And I had to make decisions almost every day. Do I stay with this project or do I go and fix up that life? And I, I, I guess I was making decisions based on what I'd be happiest with on the day that I died. It also felt to me that this was such a small thing to give back to a community that, that had just given me so much personally. So I stayed on the book. You can hear in my voice, it's still hard for me to talk about. Yeah. But then a miracle happened, a literal miracle. Maikai was shortlisted for the biggest award in the cookbook world, the Gourmand Award in Paris. 
uh, competition was the New York Times. Have you heard of the New York Times? Okay, one or two of you have. And our other competition was Noma, the cookbook from Noma Restaurant. And Noma Restaurant had just that week been named by San Pellegrino the best restaurant in the world. What was a book from the South Pacific doing in this company? How on earth could we win? But we won. And in that, it was felt like in one amazing moment, Pacific Island cuisine took its place next to the great cuisines of the world. It was, I was very mindful of all the women and the, throughout the Pacific and the communities that had engaged with me and supported me and who plugged into this process, process and it was so meaningful to them. And I found out afterwards there were prayer circles in different islands. We all wanted to win. The Power of Cuisine model was so successful as a book that we ended up making a television series, um, Real Pacific, and it's played here, I believe. I think many of you would have seen it. Um, so I'm going to play you a clip from that that explains the approach of the television series. Our journey began with the same unfortunate story told by chefs across the South Pacific. I'm always stuck in the kitchen cooking Western food and European food and I feel that the traditional cooking with me is slowly fading away. You know, unfortunately a lot of our people, they're, they're being sort of brainwashed that it's no longer good anymore to eat their own food. It's sad. You would never think of going to Thailand and not having Thai food. Mm. I think Fiji's the same. In Fijian homes there's all this amazing food that isn't necessarily in the hotels. We're so stuck in that Western way of, of presenting food. On cuisine des choses locaux et il n'y a pas un, un commentaire. The traditional dishes that we grew up with, it started to drift away. If we lost them, um, I think we're hopeless. We wanted to tell a different story, the story of South Pacific cuisine. You look at this food, there's wisdom and the history and there's survival and there's agriculture. It goes way beyond the recipe. So healthy. Yeah. Polynesian food has such a bad rap for being unhealthy. I think it's completely yeah. unjustified. We selected up and coming chefs accustomed to creating Western style food in tourist resorts and took them on a journey back into their own food cultures. In the Pacific, people come together over food, so food underpins relationships. Bon appetit. Food in the Pacific builds and strengthens community. The story of the food is the story of the people. We took resort chefs to meet the guardians of South Pacific cuisine knowledge and wisdom. We have black dalo, green dalo, pink dalo, purple dalo. When you have just one kind of taro, you lose all this knowledge. This is pickle pickle or fiddlehead fern. We connected the chefs with the primary food producers in their countries. You can never find this in a restaurant. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh my wow. goodness, look at that. Yeah. Pico Pico. And the chefs created five star meals using entirely locally sourced ingredients and recipes. The only thing that isn't local on this is what? <laughs> the plate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the plate. The chefs experienced their cuisine taking its place among the world's great food traditions. I'd come here tomorrow if that was definitely on the menus. We have something very special, but we never have this thinking of using it. Reconnecting chefs with their roots and providing an opportunity to present their traditional cuisine in a five-star context facilitated humbling transformations. Pacific Island food has just as much of a place within the culinary market as Italian or, or Greek food. Kind of affirmed my place as a Polynesian chef, knowing my food really, it's like knowing myself. It's opened my eyes to the fact that we are all connected through food and heritage. Everything is about traditional Tongan food now and I'm proud of it. Seeing that sort of food on like menus and restaurants over here and just seeing like that sort of food being appreciated like in that way was like was a great feeling. Today I was proud to be a Cook Islander. And for the local food producers it was just as profound. <laughs> this is the local market for our farmers. A local market that we've been trying to reach 
and we haven't really gotten there. And I think this is the beginning of something absolutely wonderful. Everyone experiences a simple but powerful fact that local cuisine can be a successful part of daily menus. I just needed someone from outside to come in like Robert to say, yes, Fatasi, what you've been saying we can do. And this is it, it happened today. We took our cuisine to the next level. In tourism-led economies, menus are the business plan of a nation. Where the cuisine goes, the agriculture will follow. And if a country can recognize this, everybody wins. Robert is our missing link. And, and um, I'm gonna get so emotional. <laughs> I had so much fun doing this and I, I really wanna continue doing it. We're demonstrating that the way to connect tourism and agriculture is through cuisine. And the people who control this cuisine are the chefs. It's the chefs who decide what dishes and what produce will be used on the menus of restaurants and resorts. They choose whether the ingredients for the recipes are imported from overseas or come from local primary producers. We wanted to tell a different story. The story of South Pacific cuisine, an aspirational vehicle that ignites chefs to become powerful agents of change, who can change the livelihoods of farmers, fishermen and artisanal food producers. What I love about books and television is that the, the books tend to glamorise and, and make something authoritative. Everyone knows it's hard to publish a book. When you put food or whatever in a, in, a, in a book, it becomes the gold standard. It also is where the information, I get very urgent about my work because I, I keep hearing about different recipes that are disappearing because uh, with the grandmothers and the, the kind of the fast food generation does not respect them in the same way. So I get very urgent and um, personally motivated to keep doing the cookbooks. And then the television is like almost like a hearts and minds campaign because it involves Almost everyone in the island is somehow involved in the making of the show and, and the local stars emerge and then it begins almost like a campaign around that. So books and TV um, activate cuisine and they, they educate by entertaining. Um, I released, we released our second book in 2014 at the request of the Prime Minister of Samoa, a book dedicated to Samoa. And this book also won... <laughs> a Gourmand Award for the best TV chef cookbook in the world in association with the television series. So there's clearly an appetite for our food, our cuisine, and, our, and the stories that sit behind them. So this was the economic drive behind my work, but what's emerged for me most in, in the process is the issue of Pacific health. The South Pacific is in a crisis. In Fiji, two Fijians a day have a leg amputated because of diabetes. American Samoa, Nauru and the Cooks are the most obese nations on earth and Amer uh, uh, Samoa and Tonga are right behind them. Most of us are affected in some way by this. You know, there's diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, heartbreak, shattered lives, broken dreams. And yet the key to good health is growing all around us. It's sitting in the markets, in the farms, in the villages and in the rustic recipes, Polynesian and Melanesian recipes that Pacific grandmothers cook. We all have the power to change this. Our cuisine can, take, can put our people on the right, right side of the future. It's a delicious answer to our cultural, our economic, and our physical health. Our cuisine provides a greater sense of nourishment. I'm undaunted by the massive marketing budgets of the fast and processed food companies whose products often sit right behind our health issues. Quite simply, we have a better story to tell, the story of South Pacific cuisine. I, when I look back on my work, I realize it's almost like a way of thinking. Those of you who have been to Samoa would have heard the term for a Samoa, which means roughly the Samoan way. But it's a way of looking past the self and into the community and across generations. I guess you could say it's an indigenous way of thinking. I, I certainly learned it in the Pacific, and I learned it from my parents. Community always comes first. I see it emerging in social business models um, fostered by Richard Branson and the B Team. And I'm really thrilled to see this. It's a business approach that's, that works with the power of love rather than the love of power. But it's a natural way of thinking in the beautiful islands of the South Pacific. Aruru.